just whatever song is, and then just a closer walk with me. Because these songs were long songs that she liked. I don't know if she liked them all her life or, or she liked them more because we just kept playing them for her all the time. So she got used to liking them and she was told, you better like them because that's what we're playing for you. There's musicians here, Joe and Malcolm and myself and Peggy, um, were all common to, to sit in mom's apartment and play songs for her. And believe you me, um, I don't think there was a song she didn't like. Uh, she did like the Bible songs, and, and you would often find Mom, when she was alone, she would not know how to work the TV. I, I, I have no idea how this TV works, and yet you would come to find her alone, and she always had a Bible station on the TV. And I said, well, how if you can't work the TV, do you always find this station, the mysteries of life? So. <laughs> We're going to do the tighten up here. I want to thank you, everybody that's come to Mom's Memorial. She sure enjoyed this church. Her and Dad, many years, and they, they, uh, they, uh, when we first got to swim, we were looking for a church, and of course, I guess there wasn't many many choices. It was pretty much decided we're Lutherans, we're going to go to the Lutheran church, and, and mom and dad were at this one. So, this has uh, been home for our family. I think mom and dad joined the church somewhere maybe two years before we did, so probably around 99 or 2000. Okay. Alright, we're ready to do a song for you. Let's see, okay, Peggy.
talks about what we do as uh, migrants in this life, uh, going from birth to the end of life. And this is by David White, one of my favorite poets. And it has the metaphor of watching geese fly over. Watching the geese go south, I find even in silence and even in stillness, and even in my home alone, without a thought or a movement, I am part of a great migration that will take me to another place. And though all things I love may pass away, and a great family of things and people I have made around me will see me no more, I feel them living in me like a great gathering, reach to reach a greater home. When one thing dies, all things die together and must live again. be found again in a whole new, in a new form. And everything wants to be complete. Everything wants to go home. And the geese traveling south are like the shadow of my breath, flying into the darkness on a great, on great heartbeats to an unknown land where I belong. And I like the final verse because it says a lot about what we're celebrating on Phyllis's life. This morning, they have found me full of faith like a blind child, nestled in their feathers, following the great coast of the wind to a home I cannot see. I invite you as we begin to join me in prayer. Most gracious God, we give you thanks for the journey that we take and that you are present in that journey. We give you thanks for Phyllis and her faithful worship here at Dungeness Valley Lutheran. We thank you for the extension of her family and ask your blessing upon them. We ask and thank you for the life that you gave them and the life that they celebrate today. And so with these things in mind, hear the celebration of her life. For we pray in your name. Amen. And then Dana asked me to read uh, Phyllis's obituary, which is simply a uh, very brief uh, summary of her life because I'm sure there's, there's a whole lot more to be included, right? We can share a little more after that, thank you. Yeah, that's right. Some of you are going to share her memories. Did she actually, she, did she play the violin later in life? She, uh, she played the violin when she was in grade school, and I would imagine that she may have attended maybe uh, less than a semester before the old Buick ran over her violin and canceled out her class, which I think uh, Carrie Lynn may share the, the story, and, yeah. and so I will not divulge all the finality of it. I could have commiserated with her because I played the violin as a child until uh, my mother refused any more lessons and hung it on the wall and put flowers in <laughs> well, but, 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 but she didn't put it under the tire of the car. <laughs> Well, here is uh, a little bit about Phyllis, uh, Colleen Cowan. Uh, she died on April 4th, 2021 at the Olympic Medical Center in Fort Angeles. She was born on March 9th, 1928 in, uh, is it Chrisom, Minnesota? Chisholm. Chisholm. Chisholm, Minnesota. It's just like Chisholm. Chisholm. Uh, she was born to Ernest 
understand it's Tooney uh, Erickson. And she graduated high school in 1946. She married Leonard G. Collett on April 6, 1947 in Seattle. And although she attended Seattle Business College, Phyllis was a wife and mother whose primary roles were the role was to care for her family and her home and raise her three children. In 1999, she, along with her husband, Leonard, moved to school in Washington and, as Dana said, uh, joined Phyllis was a master sewer and quilter. She also enjoyed painting and drawing in her hobby. As a young girl, she played the violin. She was a member of the Eastern Star, Chapter 112, where she received the designation of Worthy Matron twice. She is survived by her daughters, Patricia uh, Maples and Suzelle. Can you raise your hand if I pronounce these wrong? A, a son, Dana, uh, six grandchildren. Uh, is it Dana? Dina. Dina. Dina, Scott, Linda, Kari. 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 Okay, thank you. You see, I don't know the family well. <laughs> Rochelle, Rebecca. Raise your hand. Raise your hand, Rebecca. Where's Rebecca? There she is. Okay. <laughs> Seven great grandchildren, which I assume two are here. Uh, Daisy, Nora, Gwendolyn, is it Joby? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sedona, Walker, and Ryder. Walker and Ryder. Okay. In person. Yes. Okay. Phyllis uh, was preceded in death by her husband Leonard and her sister Shirley. Uh, I think that us into a place where we can share the story. Sure. I'd say one thing about uh, sharing the story, and I usually remind people, because uh, oftentimes people think that sharing the story is painful, but it's really a part of healing. Uh, I always encourage families not only to share the story, you know, for instance, after coffee or what we're going to be at, at the home of Dana, and share the story then. And as you go, go on with your life, uh, Phyllis would want you to to continue and fill out your life, and she's always part of that story. So share the story at certain occasions, like birthdays and Thanksgiving. So, uh, storytelling is part of the healing. So, thank you, thank you very much. So, as as there are so many stories, and you, and you look at just the beginning of our life with Mom, we had Sunday school, and she would get us ready for Sunday school. How she got us all ready and in the car, probably only the young mothers would understand because she would get one of us dressed and by the time the other was ready, probably that first one needed to be redressed. <laughs> we had an old car, it was, a, it was an old Plymouth, probably at that time, maybe a 51 or 52. It was cold. It did not warm up. You know, you, you would go out and start that car, and, and maybe a half an hour later you got out that car, it might be warm enough to go to Sunday school. But she brought us up in the church, and, and the church was a place that we really enjoyed. It was fun to go to Sunday school. I don't know if Sunday schools are that way anymore, but I can say that all of us as kids were mostly excited to go as you stood in your classroom and, and you did projects and stuff to get to, to learn about Jesus. Mom was a Sunday school teacher. Um, she sang in the choir. Dad sang in the choir. Um, of course, We church. sang in the choir, too. Did you? Yeah, I was in the choir. Kids, little kids' choir. <laughs> well, I don't remember. I, I don't most know. things that I got into, I got kicked out of. But <laughs> I think that maybe I did sometime in the choir. Or, or at least I was usually told that I was hall monitor, which was a really prestigious job to be a hall monitor. But um, as, as we grew in our faith, Mom, um, she grew in the organization, organization known as the Eastern Star. And the Eastern Star is, it's hard to, to, to really closely describe it other than you work your way through different 
chairs, and, and, and you're, you're giving, it's a giving organization, but it's a real camaraderie of, of the people that are, are, are in it. And it was a very, very large chapter, the, the Myrtle chapter in, in, in Seattle downtown. We would go with mom um, to not the meeting so much, but the events of celebration. And at those, we would all be joined by so many other Lutherans and other Christian based, and we would have a wonderful time um, with all the great food and celebration, of which after we're done here, we're all welcome to our house court. It's not going to be a smorgasbord, but it will be food and, and enjoyment and celebration together. So I welcome anyone else um, that would like to say something that's ready. Yeah. Patricia? Yeah. Yeah, one of my favorite memories as a young girl was mom would take us separately, Suzelle or me. I don't remember. I don't know if mom took you downtown and bought you school clothes. Grandmother did. Oh. <laughs> so we'd go downtown Seattle, we go to the Bon Marche, and we'd go up to the fabric area because she sewed all our clothes. So we got to pick out the patterns and the fabric, and, and then she would make our clothes, and then she'd take us all to lunch, or take us one by one to lunch. We'd go have lunch, and that was a, a special memory. And one of my other memories is coming home from school. I had a best friend, Sharon. We'd come home to school to our house, stop at our house first, because we wanted to watch Dark Shadows. And, <laughs> and Mom <laughs> sat with us and watched Dark Shadows. Well, then later on in life, um, Sharon got married. And mom was making wedding cakes at that time. And Sharon's wedding was about three blocks away. And she made this cake, and we had to get the wagon. We hauled the cake on the wagon to Sharon's wedding. A, a very wobbly <laughs> wagon and a three-story a three cake <laughs> assembled. And she saw, I was in Job's Daughters, which is kind of like Eastern Star, and I went through the different chairs and became honored queen, and mom was the guardian of uh, Job's Daughters, and dad was very active in it too. And she made, she made my formals for installation, for prom, she made my wedding dress, my bridesmaids dresses, my cake. She was just a. She was Mom an was ex exceptional great. She was great. She just. She also made all your Barbie doll clothes. And my Barbie <laughs> doll clothes. Yes, and I still have my and she Barbie. she made my Barbie doll, doll clothes, clothes too. And too. I have been making Barbie doll clothes because <laughs> of her. <laughs> I mean, she was she was my best friend, and I she left us on Easter Sunday and she married our father on an Easter Sunday. Oh, so that was, and, just, and she loved Easter. She made Suzelle and I our dresses and we have our little bonnets and like Dana said, we go to Sunday school and, and she just, she's, she's the best mom ever. That's all I can say. Thank you, Tricia. Yeah. So as on the sewing um, the memories, she did not sew a shirt for me, but I made my very first shirt <laughs> in 1969. I think you probably know the era, so you might know kind of the material, the muslin material. <laughs> anyway, it was very nice. It had a nice deep cut, and it had three-quarter length sleeves, and it was white. It was cool. <laughs> so, Carrie. You want me to read it? You tell us your story, however you want. Tell a story and then tell about the violin. What what do you have on your memory? I'm gonna go in the shade. Come on up here with me and, and, and go share get in space. the shade okay. with the boys the there. And, and read so often here you can stories are wonderful. Oh boy. Okay. Okay. So before I read this story, this is the violin story I'm gonna read. 
um, Nanny would tell me about the violin often, and she wanted me to write a story so it could be her with the violin. Whoa. So I'm going to go through one of my favorite memories. Um, when I was about eight years old, we would go to California every once in a while. They were living in California, and my mom would put us on a plane, and we got to go down there for, you know, ten days or something. I don't know. I was only eight. Uh, and they were management of a condo. Well, Nanny would have to get up. I call her Nanny. That's, <laughs> she's my Nanny. That's my grandma. So, um, in the morning, it was about five o'clock in the morning, and she'd have to go deliver papers. And at eight years old, and... If you knew me when I grew up, talk, 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 talk. So I would have missed way too much stuff if I would have slept in. So I got up and remember going around with her at 5 o'clock in the morning delivering papers. And she said, oh, I'm so happy you keep me awake. So that was one of my, one of my good stories that I remember. And um, my sister wanted me to, Melinda wanted me to say her story since she's not here. Um, one year for Christmas, it's kind of both of our stories, but it was pretty memorial work for her too. But it was one Christmas, we were living in Newport Hills and they came and they showed up. Really early in the morning, we were told to stay in bed, me and my sister, and my mom was out there doing something with Santa. And, uh, <laughs> and it ended up where Melinda got a bike that year. We both got bikes, and I don't know if it was from great grandma or if it was from Nanny or kind of everybody, but Melinda wanted me to share that story that it was pretty awesome for her. She really wanted a bike, all her friends had bikes. And so it was a pretty neat Christmas. And. Um, like I said, I have uh, so many memories I could just go on and on. Anytime I talked to her or was with her, I was the little kid that would rather drink tea with her and Dee than play with dolls or toys or something. So I was I always I, following her. Around. I think uh, that you talked to her a lot. Um, you would call her two or three times a week. And I would go upstairs and eat and come back down an hour later and you were still talking. <laughs> <laughs> we could talk forever and ever and ever and sometimes I would just, I mean, have to go because there was stuff I would have to do. But her and I never ran out of stuff to talk about. <laughs> so, she loved it. She loved it. <laughs> so I wrote the story, um, the violin story. I'm going to see if I can read it. I have my contacts in so I can't see. Uh, this is a story about a girl and her special violin. This is the story of a little girl named Phyllis Erickson and her Aunt Helen's violin. Phyllis was a little girl living in Hibbing, Minnesota. She was in the fourth grade. At her school, they were able to pick an instrument to learn and play in music class. Phyllis decided she wanted to be like Aunt Helen and play the violin. Helen was an excellent violinist. Helen would sing and play traditional Finnish music on the violin over the radio broadcast in Minnesota. Helen thought this was wonderful, but Phyllis wanted to play the violin just like her. Helen gave Phyllis her special violin to use in music class, and maybe one day Phyllis would play as good as Aunt Helen. One day Phyllis and the other school children were playing outside while waiting for the school bus. At uh, all the children, including Phyllis, had set their belongings in the driveway so that they could play. Including in their belongings was Aunt Helen's special violin. While the children were playing and waiting for the school bus, one of the adults were backing their car <coughs> excuse me, out of the driveway. The adult must not have seen the children's belongings because the because they backed right over the lunches, the books, the bags, and even Aunt Helen's special violin. One of the adults hit the belongings with the car. Everything flew into the air on impact. The lunches, the books, the bags, and even the violin looked to be destroyed. The special violin was shattered into a bunch of little pieces. Everyone was surprised at what had just happened. There wasn't much that could be done now but to pick up all the little pieces. So one by one, Phyllis helped pick up all the pieces of the shattered violin. They placed all the pieces in the violin case and closed it up so Phyllis could bring it back to her Aunt Helen. <laughs> Phyllis never did get in trouble for the shattered violin. There wasn't much that could 
be said or done. It was clearly just an accident. After the accident, Phyllis decided not to play the violin anymore, <coughs> excuse me, or any other instrument. <laughs> Eventually, Auntie Helen and Cousin Carol glued the violin back together. Piece by piece, they fixed <coughs> the violin to almost new condition. Sorry, I don't talk in front of people a lot. an excellent working condition and could even be played could even play beautiful music again <coughs> since being I almost need water no. <laughs> like right at the very end since being repaired it has hung on the wall at cousin Carol's house as a treasured keepsake of the violin's history now <coughs> excuse me now Phyllis 92 years old has been reunited with Aunt Helen's violin. The violin now hangs beautifully on Phyllis's wall to be remembered and enjoyed. This is the fun memory of a girl and her special violin. Thank you, Sarah. Sorry. Very much. You did a great job of putting that whole story together for me. <laughs> yeah, and, I was trying to and, remember and it, everything. And it indeed is still on Mom's wall with a, a, a beautiful plaque. What do you call it? Is that a plaque? Yeah, yeah. That's all? yeah I got it made at Costco, actually. Yeah, it's, it's like a canvas and it came framed and everything. Everybody that steps into the room, you're, you're, you're compelled to go to the wall and to read this story. So I ask if there's any other ones that want to Thank share you. a memory. Hey, Rebecca, did you want to say your memory? Sure. Would you like me to hold yeah, one yeah, for you? Yeah. Or will they let you be held? We'll see. <laughs> Can I hold you? Oh, Mama's going to tell us the story about Grandma. Um, I have lots of stories, but I mean, if I wasn't sleeping at my house or in school, I was at my grandparents' house. Um, we, I think my mom liked to follow wherever her parents went. <laughs> so we were always by Nanny and Papa, which was great because my mom was a single mom growing up, so we just went over to Nanny and Papa's in the morning before school, after school. Um, but I just remember Nanny would always take me to the mall with her when I was younger. I was like, this is fun, this is awesome, I get to go to the mall all the time. We would pick out chocolate-covered gummy bears. <laughs> um, and we'd you know, sometimes take the city bus, and then sometimes we would take her, her white, what was it, Chrysler, I don't know what it was. And down the road, she told me, she said, you know, I really only took you to the mall because I couldn't remember where I parked. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Nanny taught me everything. I feel like I know today I know how to sew because of her. I feel like she was the glue to our family. She kept things going. Um, family events, Thanksgiving, Christmas, it was always such a beautiful show that her and Papa put on. Um, I remember when she got her hip surgery, I was over there every day helping put the lotion on, put her stocking on. Um, she was just, as we all know, an incredible light in all of our lives. She touched everyone in just such a beautiful way. Um, very accepting of whoever you Very are. accepting, yeah. loved everyone. Um, I just... I'm, I'm just really glad she's with Papa now. I think that was, I remember her just saying, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go be with Papa, and whenever God wants me to go, I'm ready. So I'm just, I'm, I think she's really happy now, and she's our, our guardian angel, and um, yeah, I have more stories if you ever want to hear. <laughs> Thank you. Don't yeah. forget the Swedish no. dreams. I make them too. Oh, yes, we have every Christmas we make this. Yeah, I do too now. We're all filled with sugar because of her. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all our recipes. Yeah. Did you have something yes. that you wish to share? So I wanted to share my story. Come up here. I'm fine uh, here. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, the dog. I wanted to share my story about Phyllis during a very special time in both Dana and my life um, when we decided to get married. Um, and so we were both in. Oh, 
Oh, sorry about that. So we were both in California. <laughs> Anyhow, we were both in California, and we were going to have our wedding here in Washington. And how do you plan for that? How do you decide how everything's going to come together? Well, Phyllis took the lead and helped us out and helped us organize and get everything together as well as Rebecca and Rochelle who um, handled all the little items that were at the church, the music and all that. And we had a very simple, nice family wedding. My family traveled up here and um, Phyllis and Len's family were here and Dana, of course. And so it was just wonderful how they put everything together for us with so much love. And so that is a really important time that both Phyllis and I got to share. Every weekend we would call her and she would let us know where she was at and what she had um, scheduled for us and how all the events were going to come together. And that was wonderful because I didn't have to worry about anything. <laughs> for and the model was, way that they had at your wedding too. Oh, yeah. right. I remember the wedding. I'm so yes. cool. Yeah, we had the wonderful model A, <laughs> and um, this was in the little town of Sumner when it was a little town. Mm -hmm. They drove us all over in the little model A, and it was just so wonderful. With boots and cans dragging behind. <laughs> <laughs> Traditional. <laughs> Yeah, so, and also Len and Phyllis have a little garden shack in the back of their home, and this was in Bellevue, and they put a little sign on it, and Len painted it all so cute, and it was the little honeymoon suite for us. So, oh, <laughs> pretend, we didn't have to stay in the garden yeah, shack. pretend, because when you went inside, you, we found garden implements. <laughs> Could I say something again? Yo, please do. Okay. Do you guys remember, what was it, their 25th anniversary where she got Grandpa that ring? Isn't that the one that has the 25 diamonds in it? Do you remember that she put that ring in a cake and he yes. almost broke his food? <laughs> he ate the ring. <laughs> well, he didn't swallow it, but he ate it. Yeah. You know, yeah. might as well have. Could have happened. Nanny yeah, always told me to write this stuff down because I always remember everything. Well, I think that you'll be the family historian. Yeah, there you go. And that's what she told me already. Okay. You guys want to know anything, come to me. <laughs> well, if there's no other stories. Oh, yeah, may I say something? Oh, please, 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 yes. Hi, I'm Christina. I was, um, I was uh, Phyllis and Len's caregiver a few years ago when Len was coming to the end of his life. And I was fortunate enough to just be welcomed in as part of the family. And so I don't remember whether it was every night of the week or four nights a week, but I was there in the evening to help them with dinner and put, do the dishes and get Len to bed. And yeah. then Phyllis and I would talk, and she would tell me all of these stories. <laughs> I knew all of you through her stories. Yeah. And she was more popular than a teenager because her phone would ring a dozen times a night while I was there for my three hours. <laughs> and, oh, and she would give them, oh, it's another call for me. <laughs> and she would go to the phone and it would be a family member or a friend or someone that just truly loved her. And I fell in love with her from listening to all of these stories. She taught me about the coffee special drip thing, yeah, coffee yeah. all the time. I was constantly, for safety reasons, running to the stove to turn off the flame. She's like, oh no, that stays on because the water has to stay hot because you gotta do the coffee. <laughs> and so I went out and bought the, the coffee drip thing. Toddy, there toddy, we go, toddy, toddy coffee. One too. <laughs> she taught me about toddy coffee. And uh, over the nights, she would, um, after we put Len to bed, she would uh, be so proud and show me all the things that she'd um, sewn or whatever she had mm -hmm. in her drawers and just wait they're in here somewhere and, you know she pulled them out and I heard about all of the joke daughter stories yeah. and sewing your prom dresses oh and your doll clothes and she was so proud of those things 
and she loved being a wife and mother. It was something that defined her. And in this age where we're kind of wondering what we're doing, it was like a validation. It's okay if that's all I am. That's all I am is a wife and mother, or, or you know, and mothering my caregiving life. You know? And that's okay. And I, I think about Phyllis every day. She reminds me how to have a life with grace. And I, I just am grateful for Dana and Pam and their friendship. Thank well, you. I thank, thank you, you because you were so kind to Mother and, and you gave all you gave it with all your heart. You were nothing but love for the family. Yeah. And and you've gone so much and, and family's here for you too. Yes. You, As I know when I have questions about what do I do with my car insurance? They want to do this to my car. Are they you know, is this the right thing to do? Yes, go to another place. <laughs> right, yes, right. Yeah. They're cheating you. Go to another place. So Dana's the one for advice. Thank you. Yeah, Nanny was almost a queen. I don't have a lot to say, but it, it occurred to me, well, first of all, I will say on a real personal level, I'll never play Coat of Many Colors ever again <coughs> without seeing Phyllis's face and hearing her voice. That was the number one song that she always asked me for. That was the first thing she would always ask me for. And some of the things that were shared here today made me kind of want to say, <clears throat> when I was seven years old, my grandma set me down at a treadle machine that was made in the 1800s, and she started me sewing quilt blocks. So I've been making quilts since I was seven years old. And then I met Phyllis, and I got a load of Phyllis's seamstress nest. And then I saw a couple of Phyllis's quilts, and it just occurred to me sitting here, I didn't make any more quilts after I saw Phyllis. <laughs>
Oh, I got it. You got it okay?